must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Uh, my name is Brandon Pollan, and of course, as always, I am joined by my other two great co-hosts, F. Scott Field and Stephanie Wyrock. And today, we actually have the pleasure of having a large group of people on the show today. And actually, to be honest, this is probably the mo- this is definitely the most people we've ever had on a single episode. As today, we're interviewing three students and a faculty member from um, the Columbia University DPT program to really talk about kind of their student-run elective that they've kind of developed. Um, so, with that, we're actually going to be we have the pleasure of having Dr. Lonnie Stewart, who is the ACCE and the Director of Clinical Education at the school along with Joe Lipsky, James Sinodinos, and Sean Whited. So everyone, you know, thank you so much for coming on. And, you know, I appreciate the perspective and the time. And, you know, if you guys could, do you guys think you could kind of briefly go down the line and kind of introduce yourselves, starting with Dr. Stewart and then Joe and then James and then Sean? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is Dr. Lonnie Stewart. I'm really happy to be on here. And I am uh, the Director of Clinical Education. I'm an Assistant Professor of Rehabilitation and Regenerative Medicine at uh, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And I happen to be the faculty advisor for this student-created, student-run elective. My name is Joe Lipsky, currently a third-year DPT student at Columbia University, uh, finishing up my clinical education at Exos in Phoenix. And I, along with Sean Whited, are, am one of the co-founders of the Perspectives on Practice Elective. Hi, my name is James Nadinos. I'm a second-year DPT student at Columbia University. I'm the, the second, second generation of the Perspectives on Practice Elective. I've followed a in the footsteps of Joe and Sean in classes right now, doing my second clinical affiliation this summer. And yeah, that's it. Hi, my name's Sean Whited. I'm a third year DPT student as well at Columbia. I, with Joseph Lipsky, created the Perspectives on Practice Elective with the help of Dr. Stewart guiding us and directing us. I'm currently in my last affiliation for um, clinical uh, internships at Spear Physical Therapy in New York City. And I used to be, I'm a career changer, I used to be a professional musician prior to going to uh, graduate school for physical therapy. Wow, what a great breadth of students and also a clinical educator and professor from Columbia that's joining us today. You know, I'm really interested and how, where this idea of a student-run elective came from and how you guys worked as a team to form this and kind of what this all entails. So could you give us a little background about that? I'm actually going to start it off. I'm going to hand it off real quick to Joe and Sean because I was, a, uh, I was an adjunct professor uh, teaching them um, a course. And both Joe and Sean came up to me and knew that I was in private practice and wanted to start a club on private practice. And I said, well, I might not be able to do everything, but I, could, I know some people and I, we, could, we could you know, come up with something. But uh, they took it a, a little bit of a step further. So I'm gonna let Joe and Sean uh, go into that. All right, Sean, maybe I'll give a bit of the backstory and then you'll dive into the actual process because I think that was, that was uh, your real bread and butter is uh, really selling the program on how it's gonna be beneficial for both the students and the faculty. So. Uh, Sean and I were in the midst of midterms in our first year, second semester, and Sean came up to me and was like, Joe, we should, we should start a, we should start like a networking club, a private practice club. I'm like, yeah, it's a great idea. Sounds good. Uh, what would that look like? And we started looking into it. Uh, we realized we needed a faculty on board. 
So that's how, you know, we asked Dr. Stewart. We went to Dr. Krasinski with the idea and she was like, hmm, interesting. Why don't you guys take you know, X, Y, and Z into consideration and come back? And I think Sean would be able to better answer the rest of it. Um, but that was really the backstory. We kind of just were interested in like, hey, we want more business education and we want to really take advantage of the Columbia University network. That was really where the idea was. Uh, Thanks, Joe. So I had a huge interest in business owner um, and private practice because I was a business owner in my former career. And that's why I approached Joe. So when we spoke to our, the director of our program, Dr. Krasinski, initially there was a little pushback concerning, we already had some business elective in the curriculum and, and how this was going to be different. And we really kind of painted the picture of what our idea was and how it was different in respect to uh, this was an opportunity for students to really take charge of their education, reach out and find someone that's a specialist or a leader in the field in that area and come in and lecture it would give the students an opportunity to make meaningful network, uh, networking opportunities for themselves and for their classmates. And it would also help the program to develop relationships with the physical therapy community and the leaders of that community. So it's oftentimes the way the students uh, see it is that there's a large difference between the way the academics are run and the way practice is really handled and concept and the way that we presented it was that this was really the marriage of the two so that everyone on all sides would win and and be able to benefit from this. I'm in private practice, Sean, so I really appreciate that you guys set this up because as a student, you know, when you have your business class and you, you know, do your business plan, you don't necessarily really think about the real world concepts behind it, I think. And the fact that you guys made the, a part of the curriculum for this specific course to go out into the community and find physical therapists that you, that would present content to you is really quite, I think, impressive because in private practice, we need to be making those relationships not only with physicians or referral sources, but with our own kind, with physical therapists, with, uh, with local gyms, because as private practitioners, we are clawing and scratching to make sure that we're getting our patients through the door. And so the fact that you are working on this skill is really, I think, quite impressive. Yeah, no, I would totally agree with all those comments, Steph. And it's you know, first kind of, you know, I want to ask this question first to Dr. Stewart here, because I'm kind of curious, as they kind of mentioned before the initial pushback of kind of starting this up. But, you know, and of course, I'll ask him this. And then if anyone else has anything to add, please feel free. But, you know, what are some of the pros and cons with having a student run elective class as part of the curriculum? <laughs> well, okay, so first off, I, I didn't even really know that this thing took its own legs. Uh, behind my back because when the next time that Sean and Joe came to me, they're like, Dr. Krasinski, who's our program director, love her to death, said, this is going to be a class. And I was like, oh God, what have I gotten into? So one of the positives was is that the students created this. And then one of the negatives was, or one of the challenges was, is that the students created this. And, uh, and I had, I was now I'm, I'm going, I'm getting my doctor of uh, science degree at Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions. And so I'm, I was just at the same time learning about building a curriculum and teaching methods, et cetera. So this all came together at the same time. And it, it was a lot because I was still learning about how to, how to put a course together. And I was by no means an expert, but now I'm at Columbia University, at, right? And now these students come up to me, want my help. And I was just like, let's just get down in the dirt and do this. So together. So it was, this whole thing has been a learning opportunity 360 for all of us. Uh, and it's really enhanced my teaching. And I think it's enhanced their idea of just what they're getting into. I mean, this is a, a, a tremendous profession. And already, we've had people come into uh, onto our little program on the eighth floor of the Neurological Institute to talk about what it's like out there, and the different kinds of problems that they're dealing with. And, and also really big issues like, um, like, like payment and reimbursement and the perception of physical therapy and how do you keep your patients. And so they've, I guess my point is being that they, uh, 
they we've learned a tremendous amount about what's happening on the ground out there that you don't get when you're looking uh, when you're where you're doing your special tests and learning of you know the nuts and bolts of uh, an e exam and eval. <laughs> The challenges have been met together with the students and myself, and uh, I think we've met them really well. It's made it for some really interesting discussions. How cool that you were able to do this curriculum while you're doing your Doctor of Science. Wow, that's, that's crazy how those worlds collide. And it's so cool that everybody gets to learn along with you, Dr. Stewart. That is incredible. It was a little too much at times, but it was, it was all good. <laughs> no, it was great. I'm just going to jump in. A major pro as a student was uh, because I, I jumped into this course a little bit after Joe and Sean already had it on the ground. I remember going to their first meeting and being extremely interested in their vision. And um, I was particularly interested in a certain topic that I wanted to hear more about. And Joe and Sean just said, you know, go outside of school. They gave me the, the freedom and the platform to say, go out, network communicate with professionals that you want to hear about and then bring it back to Columbia. And it gave me the, the opportunity to coordinate a lecture and hear something that I was interested in and that other students in my program were interested in. So this, a major pro of this style is that it gives students the opportunity to learn more about what they're really interested in, and to step outside and network and learn how to handle yourself as a professional with people that are, you know, at the top of their field and learn how to communicate with them and learn how to coordinate. So that was really cool um, as a, a student to be able to do that when I was just a, a first, first going on second year in the program. So that was an amazing opportunity. I'm just gonna jump in really quick and say, I think uh, in our faculty meetings, there's a topic of discussion that's always about how students are acting or not acting professional. I mean, it seems to be something that we're always working on. And this course allowed students to take the lead to go out and to present themselves to uh, other professionals, to bring them in, uh, design the course, and then put together a series of lectures. And it, it really was its own professional development uh, mechanism, which I thought was really great. How did you guys pick James to be the mentee? That's what I wanna know. I think it's so cool that you have found somebody to fill your shoes. And I'm wondering why you picked James. And then I'm also wondering who James is gonna pick next. And if that person is listening, do they know they're being picked? So I'll go ahead and jump in. That's a great question. We wanted to make sure that our following uh, into this, this role would really be people that wanted to see this thrive, that really understood the vision of what we were trying to accomplish. And it's not just a, a class. So we spent the first year, uh, first semester really, uh, we had I think seven, almost six or seven uh, class meetings that first semester for this course. And we found who was attending regularly and we offered all of the regular attenders that were really interested and had participated a lot uh, to try out, if you will, for the position and do an interview. So they, uh, we approached them, they wrote a little blurb about what their vision is of using the platform to continue going forward. And, um, and then we took them and did an interview process. So Joe and I actually got some uh, management type experience where we were able to sit down with Dr. Stewart's help and develop an interview uh, some questions, go through that. And after we had done the interview, we originally had five candidates and we chose based on who fit our, our, our vision of where we want to take this, their understanding of it, and even their ideas of what they wanted to accomplish if they were chosen to be course directors going forward. So James had participated a lot. He very early on saw a lot of potential for our vision and really showed a lot of interest and and just gumption uh, just getting things done and excitement in it so he was a natural fit for us i think that's great guys and you know one thing that i'm kind of curious that you kind of just alluded to this has kind of prompted me to ask this is what are kind of what in terms of the vision what are you guys looking to add or change or modify with this kind of what you guys have done now to continue to make it better to make it continue to progress like you guys have been doing one one thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is well, really really two things. One is make sure we're capturing what the class 
wants to learn more about. And I think so far we've done a good job of taking a pulse of the class and seeing what the areas of interest are and tailoring, our, tailoring the, the lectures to what is meeting the students' desires. And I think I need to do a better job in the future about either sending out polls or forms or just doing a better job of surveying people in our class. You know, what, what do you want to get out of this class? What do you want to hear about? What want? What, what particular types of people or what particular topics do you want to learn more about so that we can either encourage people like Joe and Sean encourage me to go out and network or I personally can go out and try to find someone that would be a good um, lecturer at Columbia. And secondly, just doing a, a better job of documenting how each lecture goes in terms of what students' opinions are of the lectures, getting formal reflections of what they got out of it, what they can put into practice uh, in the future, what questions they would have liked to ask, other things like that, and really get a, a firm documentation of the events and how students are perceiving these events. One thing that I think is really cool about what you guys have described is the fact that you, Sean and Joe, really sat down and interviewed people and wanted to make sure that the people that they quote unquote hired match the vision of their specific program. And we had talked earlier about uh, where you guys are in clinical rotations. And I know one of you is at Spear and we had talked about how they have a really good culture. And I think that that's so important in private practice is making sure that you are hiring people or interviewing, viewing people based on the culture uh, that you want to create, especially as a manager, because that's what's going to make a successful private practice. And that's what's going to make your patient care better than anybody else's is the, and attract people into your clinic is that great culture. So I think that that's really an important uh, lesson for our listeners to hear is that, you know, when you are interacting with other professionals or networking at conferences or even within your class, making sure that you're thinking about what is the mission that I want to accomplish here and how are these people going to help us help me achieve that mission. So I think that's really a cool, cool thing that you guys have done. Yeah. I, I think you also bring up spirits just, a, a really good point. And uh, Dan Rutenberg, the president, has just been such a fundamental and like essential asset to us in the entire course of really my like educational uh, career at Columbia. He came in, spoke during our first semester. And then from that point on, Sean and I agreed once we uh, wanted to start this class, he was someone we had to bring on immediately to come speak. He was, I think, our second speaker. He gave a phenomenal presentation on leadership. And from that, our relationship has just grown. Uh, Dan brought up uh, some of his clinical directors during the class, which allowed for, we, we probably hung out for like at least an hour after Dan finished presenting, just talking about what life is like after school, what it's like directing a clinic, what, what's Dan's experience owning a clinic, what's that difference? You know, maybe, maybe you don't have an aspiration to own your own place, but you do, you do want a leadership role. And I think a clinical director role is, you know, a perfect fit. And we're, we're also in talks of, with them of possibly doing almost like a, a pseudo ICE day, right? So as if student were to go in and shadow a therapist, a student were to go in and shadow the clinical director and see what a day in the life of is like of like a person in the managerial role. So like what decisions are they making per every day? What, what problems are they uh, facing? What kind of things just pop up on a day-to-day -day basis? And it's things like that that really make this class special just because, you know, we've developed this living syllabus and as it grows, we grow. And there's just so many different areas that I think this, this class can potentially lead to different educational opportunities. You know, you think about in-classroom experience and then out-of-classroom experience. Uh, this class really provides a platform for both. And then if you th we were even talking about creating a podcast for the students. That, that would be another way that students can kind of develop more content for the class, reach more people, especially like, you know, via the internet like we're doing right now, right? Because right now we're limited to geography. So, you know, honestly, I think the sky's the limit for this class as long as we can continue to find, you know, motivated students like James to, you know, keep this thing going and have a vision completely for it on their own. Yeah, Joe, I'd have to agree with you there. You know, the sky really is the limit. And, and uh, you know, you could make the course into a podcast very easily. I mean, 
you know, even if you just record each session um, and release that as the episode, there it is right there. I mean, that, that that's pretty easy to do. But, uh, you know, I think so many people would gain value from that. I don't know what the, the loopholes and, and the red tape might, might be with doing something like that. But, you know, it seems like it's pretty easy. But since we are talking about school and class here, I do have to kind of bring it back to the educational side of things and ask. I'll start with Dr. Stewart and then we can kind of go if you guys want to add. But, you know, was there any sort of research that you guys used uh, that kind of supports student-run classes in higher education? And, and did you guys as students bring that to, to present when you made your pitch? Ooh, I can't tell whether they, they brought this stuff to their pitch. And my guess is they, they didn't because they didn't quite know yet. <laughs> but what I, was, what I was in the depths of learning at that time was about uh, learner-centered curriculums and about student-centered learning. And so we were, we were moving away from Bloom's taxonomy, which takes up so much of how we, how we devise curriculums and, and learning objectives. And now talking about Robert Marzano, who took, who took the concept to, into like med, metacognitive uh, systems, like learning how to learn. And so he kind of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Marzano, but he kind of took Bloom's taxonomy and, and kicked it up a notch. And so this whole class really fit into the learning how to learn. So we had to give it some structure. And it also was in line with Fink and her uh, significant learn creating significant learning experiences. And all of this was a- intrinsic motivation from the students. So that made it ma- meaningful for them. So every speaker that came, uh, every speaker that came for the first couple of, of uh, meetings was was very highly attended and uh, and this all came directly from their motivation to want more from what they were learning peripherally in the classes so that's kind of like the the general uh, scope but then specifically we take a look at the literature as well a little bit later and there there's some examples of uh, student-led electives in uh, medical school at, at uh, the Alpert Medical School of Brown University. They have a, an elective on health disparities that's student run. I've seen other examples like student run pro bono clinics, but that didn't quite fit into what we were doing. So there, the literature is a little lean, but it's happening out there. And I have yet to have any, see anyone that's uh, published anything that's happening at, at PT schools at the moment. But this, side note, are you yeah. guys considering doing some research on it? Because if not, that needs to be uh, in the works, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think with, uh, with Joe and Sean, we did one poster for CSM. And then with James's group, we're thinking about how, how we can get some data out of this, probably qualitative, do some interviews and see. And also, I was just going to say one of the challenges is assessment. So how are we assessing how well we're doing? That is one of the challenges I see in these other in these other uh, student run electives. They're they're a little they're a little lean on the assessment section too. So it's like you kind of uh, do the thing, but you don't quite reflect on it. So one thing that we do. Sorry, it's I mean it's tough to to come up with an assessment when you're the pioneer. Yeah. You know when you're <laughs> the, when you're the first one out there. There's nothing to compare it to. So you're kind of building the plane on the way down. You know totally. Oh, or as we're flying it. And so what we're doing is we have students reflect uh, after they come to each lecture. Uh, what did they learn about it? Uh, what had they wished had happened during that lecture? And then we're hoping to do uh, some uh, cumulative assessment at the end to ask students like, so what do you think? What did you like? What didn't you like? What would you like to see change? So I can speak to. Joe and my um, understanding of the research uh, as far as student-run education goes, we didn't know the research going into it, just plain and simple. We just knew that we wanted to learn stuff that we weren't seeing in the, the system that we were a part of. I, you know, my background, I was an educator. So I guess intuitively as a musician and someone that teaches people to learn by doing, I understood intuitively that, that that's a good component to have an educational model. And I'm the type of person, and Joe is as well, that we just like to jump in and get things done, learn while we're doing things. And that's the way we learn. And we set the model up around that with Dr. Stewart's help. So when we went and spoke to Dr. Krasinski, um, those components came into it. But Dr. Krasinski, our, our director, is also very supportive of student um, leadership. And that's a big component of how she wants to run the program at Columbia in that she wants students to 
be able to see where they want to go and help them get there. So when we came to her with this problem of we want to do this and it, we don't know how, but we have this idea. We think we know how we want to do it. And it was originally a club. She saw the potential of it and encouraged us to not just do that, but take it one step forward and, and make it into a class and, and go big with it. And we're there, very thankful for that opportunity. So she knows the value of student-led ed education and supported it. And part of her being the director influenced us to understand the value of that going into that meeting. So guys, I think this has been a really great perspective with that. And, you know, something that we kind of want our audience to hear that's not only comprised of, you know, healthcare providers, but all, and also future educators, but also perhaps some current educators that are listening to this. And, you know, this next question I got more specifically for Dr. Stewart here, you know, what would you suggest, you know, because obviously we want something that's kind of easily implementable that faculty and programs can consider using something really quick and that's easy to implement to help. Yeah. You know, what would you recommend to be a selling point to, to other faculty members to kind of help promote an idea that's similar to this to a student-run directive if perhaps there's hesitation? Well, one, it, it, it's easy to implement. So, you know, a lot of programs already have a, a lecture series of some sort. And if you add a little structure underneath of that and you start getting the students involved with that, th that could easily take off uh, in the direction that this course has taken off in. Certainly, uh, certainly, we have an advanta advantageous position being in the city with so many different providers that we could pull from them. So maybe our location is good for that. However, with technology, you can pipe people in through Zoom or through Skype and, uh, and, and do meetings that way and still get something out of it. So I think maybe technology has broken down those barriers. I think the single most important ingredient was the uh, program director saying, do this, and definitely was on board. And so the, the, barrier, the barrier wasn't there. And that was unbeknownst to me because, the, the, because Sean and Joe basically took that barrier down through those discussions that I was not a part of. <laughs> so, but that, that made it really easy. When the, when, the, when the program director said, come on into my office, I want to tell you that these guys have a great idea. You should make it into a course. And I was like, okay, then it's happening. <laughs> Nice. And that hasn't like cost any more money to the program or anything like that, has it, Lonnie? It's minimal. So uh, at each at each lecture, we have we've decided that, you know, we're going with our values. So despite the fact that we have some pizza there, we also have like seltzer and uh, tangerines and or some sort of fruit, fruit and veggie option there as well. So it's really, you know, I would say maybe maybe we spend uh, maybe we spend uh, close to 75 bucks for each meeting just to feed people and have them show up. I think that's just a good idea, but you certainly don't have to do that, but we do. Adds a little touch of class. <laughs> yeah, I would assume bribery helps. Are they, all, are they all New York style pizzas, Chicago style pizza, Detroit style pizza? It's, it's New York, yeah. We, I, we don't have, I guess I don't know where I would get the Chicago style. That'd be a special meeting. So my question going off of that is you guys have talked a lot about how a little bit previously how it's helped make get out into the community, network with other practitioners. But what about your clinical skills? How has being a part of this class made you better physical therapist? So I feel that first and foremost, the, the main thing is that seeing it from the perspective of say a clinic director or even the CEO of a company, which is one of the values of uh, perspectives that we've gotten through this class, shows me what it is that the company actually values, how the company is trying to achieve it, how the company is creating a culture that achieves uh, those values and serves its customers. So when you come out of PT school, typically what you have is a perspective of, I'm trying to use my skills uh, with this patient that's right in front of me. And there, there can be, you know, a range of struggle with that. And what this class has added to, to me, especially, is I'm seeing more than just the patient in front of me. I'm seeing the healthcare system. I'm seeing the company. I'm seeing that specific clinic's values and how I can contribute and be a valuable member of that team, not just in the clinic, but the whole company and the whole healthcare system, how I can be valuable in adding value to the patient and how I work on that spectrum, getting them from where they are to where they need to be. So what has it added to me as a clinician is I, I can't even put into words the value it's given me personally. No, Sean makes a really good point. And that's definitely something I've taken away 
uh, there's like multiple levels, right, of how this class has really made me a better clinician. And I think one way is that I now look at things from a different perspective and how to view things from multiple perspectives, right? So when, when you're sitting in a classroom and you're just trying to digest information, you're just like, okay, like, what am I trying to learn right now? What do I need to know for the test? And what do I need to know that I can take into the clinic? But when you flip the role of, uh, okay, I'm not really like a student anymore. I'm trying to create an experience for my classmates and really drive home a point. Like why, why, why are we bringing in this person? Why is it important? So we need to then frame the, the, the classroom or the environment in a way that helps drive home that message. And then you kind of go into class, like, you know, that next day after, after, after we put on the class, we have to go into class and then we think, okay, well, you know, why is the professor saying it like this? Or why are they, why are they making the slideshow look like this? Or why are they having us do these types of techniques in this way? You know, maybe there's a different layer that they want us to take away here. And I think by kind of understanding that and then taking it to the clinic, you kind of realize that, okay, when you have to teach a patient something or when you have to, you know, advocate for them, there's multiple levels and there's multiple layers. And it's not just, you know, what you might perceive at first. There's definitely usually more to the story than you. Yeah, so to, to add on with, to what Joe was saying, I think as a clinical PT, through this course, we're not developing our hands-on clinical skills, but we're developing a perspective of what what is important to our patients. With the lectures that we heard so far, there have been some great lectures that focus on how can we be the best PTs for our patients? How can we put patient-centered care first? And then how can we be leaders that manage both other PTs as well as properly manage our patients and promote the best outcomes for them. So in the sense of becoming a, b- a better clinical PT, we're, we're developing this, the skill set, that intangible type skill set, the skill set that isn't your hands-on skills, it's not your therax skills, but it's the skills that really make you a great leader and a great educator for your patients and for the people around you. I think that that's even more important, in my opinion, than even de- than even developing the clinical skills, because a lot of times patients are going to see that and react to that first. I do think that it's really important to develop clinical skills, but those can be learned very easily. You can take a course and practice those skills. And as you guys know, in school, you know, you practice all the time for practicals. But one thing that I really appreciate about this conversation is that you bring up leadership so much because this is something that is so important in our profession. And I've heard a lot of educators talk about how it is lacking in our profession. And Chad Cook made a very great argument last at uh, last 2016 or 17 CSM during his Sarah Soli lecture about how we need to be um, we need to be choosing physical therapist students based on these soft skills that you talk about or these intangible skills. And the fact that you guys have an opportunity to work on this you do in real life versus just sitting in a classroom listening to somebody lecture to you about how leadership skills are important, you're actually putting them into action. And that's exactly what we do as PTs every single day is we we lead the patient down the right path so that they can get better. We motivate them to really see that they can get better. And then we advocate for them throughout our careers to make sure that they have great access to our care, that they, have, that they can pay for our care, and that they are helping to get the word out that physical therapy can really help improve the quality of life of a lot of people. So I just want to say that I really appreciate what you guys are doing and what Dr. Stewart has helped you do, because this is something that I think is really needed more in our profession. And I really encourage any other educators out there, if you could contact our podcast and tell us what you guys are doing to help train leadership in your students, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, that's a great point, Steph. And I think, you know, it's not just about the, the leadership skills, but it's, it's really about changing the educational model. Because a lot of what, what's out there right now is, is stale. It's not working. It's not uh, ideal. And the more, more and more guests we have on this podcast and the more models that we see out there, 
the better the ideas are. And I think we're, we're really starting to see some amazing ideas really taking root, really working. Um, I mean, we, we interviewed a medical school that doesn't even use lectures anymore. So I, I mean, you know, these models are what we need more of out there. And, and Sean, I want to give you a, a, a bit of kudos for kind of starting this idea rolling from taking an experience from your, your past career in business and in education and really using it to put forth this next idea in, in your next career, if you will. Um, and I kind of wanted to, to see, like this thing kind of started with the idea that, hey, we kind of want to learn more about business and private practice, but it kind of sounds like it's morphing into a bigger breadth of, of possible new avenues and new guests that are going to be coming into lecture, not just private practice, not just business, but um, bigger areas of physical therapy and real world practice. So could you guys maybe talk a little bit about uh, some of the directions this thing might be heading and, and bigger, bigger ideas that might be coming down the pipeline? Yeah. So I, I loved everything that you just talked about in terms of the way that uh, PT education is transforming in the sense that things things aren't black and white like the way we learn them in the classroom there's so much gray area and i think that this student run elective class gives us some of that gray area a lot of what we learn in school um, is prepping for a multiple choice test and this this class helps to bring in people who give us that fresh perspective of when you when you go out into the real world things aren't you know, straight black and white from your textbook. There's so much that we need to learn to develop those intangible skills. And I, I think another part, uh, adding on to how PT education can transform is this interdisciplinary approach, which is becoming more popular. And it's something that we really want to implement in this class. And I think that is the future of this class. We've been, we've been talking a lot in our weekly meetings about how we can, we have this amazing opportunity at Columbia to be with nursing, medical students, public health students, and occupational therapy students. And we have this, this network of people that we can be working with. And we really need to tap into that. And we really need to establish interprofessional connections to enhance our education because it's right there in front of us. And we can easily grab onto it and we can really learn from each other. And I, I think that's the way that we need to go uh, in the future because in the real world, Everything is interdisciplinary in the hospital setting, in the outpatient setting. Everything is interdisciplinary, and we need to implement that into our education. So it sounds like, James, that one of the things that you would like to see changed in DPT education is having more leadership opportunities for students and working more on some of those uh, diverse skills that aren't just black or white. I'm interested to know, and we ask this of all of our guests, what the rest of your thoughts are. And if you could change one aspect of DPT education, uh, what would you want to change? I think I started to touch on it already. And I think that the, the thing I would love to change is from the get-go, making our, our physical therapy program more interdisciplinary in the sense that we, I'm now in my second year of my program at Columbia, and I... I don't even know what the curriculum is for the medical students. And I, I get to see them here and there on campus, but I know a general sense of when their rotations are, when their didactic period is, but I don't, I don't even have a full comprehension of what classes they're taking at the same time that I'm taking classes. And that's so sad because we're, we're on the same campus. We share facilities. So I would love to change the way that, that PT students integrate with other healthcare professionals making anatomy courses and orthopedic courses more integrated. Maybe physical therapy students can go to orthopedic surgeons and teach therapeutic exercise classes. So and maybe orthopedic surgeons or you know, students who are on the ortho track in the medical field can come and give lectures on surgeries just because there's, there can be a disconnect in our professions. And it's, it would be so easy to fix because the opportunity is there. We can so easily learn from each other and it would be extremely beneficial for both sides to take the knowledge that we're developing individually and collaborate together because it'll help us in our future practice. Well, yeah, uh, well said, well said. Is, is cost something we can change? Uh, I don't know if that falls in the scope of this, this, this conversation. <laughs> you can say that, Joe, sure. Oh, absolutely. You said if you could change anything about DPT yep. education, what would you change? 
Hey, well, there's, well, there's some what? programs out there that are trying to cut the cost by cutting it down to two years. I mean, there, there are some in, innovative ideas out there. So we'll, we'll, we'll take all answers. Well, and I think actually, you know, in all seriousness, that's one thing that really sparked this class too, is Sean and I, you know, we looked at, look, what, what's like the debt to income ratio going to look like after school? I, I think that some, that's something like fundamental. Okay, here, here's, my, here's my, you know, concrete answers. Uh, building more like basic financial education into a DPT curriculum. And to, well, to be honest, it needs to be in prior level educational curriculums more so, but, and I understand you, you also can't learn everything in DPT school, right? Like it's an entry level degree for a reason. And that's why there is continuing education and pursuing knowledge on your own. But yeah, like showing students that there are just so many other options other than just, yeah, like either, okay, like I can become a clinician, I can be a business owner or like a standard clinical owner or I can go into education, I can do research, but I mean, there's just so, so many options. There's countless, countless options of ways to improve our health system and just our health care, how we provide it in general. So as far as what I think would be the most important thing to change, I, I'm going to give an umbrella term of leadership and give some explanation of that. I don't think leadership is something you learn about sitting in a classroom, getting a lecture on different personality styles and different ways of resolving issues and conflict or learning psychology about leadership. You learn leadership by doing. And that can be anything from a, you know, a simple project about what you want to develop as a career path as a clinician, which we've incorporated, to you, know, you reaching out and you know, setting a new bar and, and really going out there and taking leadership over your own education and development, even while in school, like Joe and myself did. And I think the, we, we put so much pressure on multiple to- choice tests like James brought up in, in the school, which is important. We all want to pass uh, the, the licensing exam. And, but we, we kind of miss out when we are telling students we want them to be the leaders of the next generation, but all we're telling them how to lead is sit behind a desk and read a book, and you don't even get the human interaction with it. So my answer would definitely be leadership, and, and not just the leadership you talk about, but leadership where people is like, what do you want to do with your life? And then go do it. Nice. Dr. Stewart, what's, what's, what would be your answer to if you could change one aspect? Well, I'm curious to hear what your response would be, too, because these have been some great answers. Those are some phenomenal answers, and I think it gives you an idea of the caliber of student I've been lucky to work with, and I I, I really appreciate their perspective. And I'm still, you know, I'm still new at this. uh, I'll I'll admit. And so, one of the things that I that I've seen are are two two things, two themes that we have we have packed our curriculum so tight. It's like a can of tuna, and uh, there is no extra room. There's no breathing room. And I don't know why students should be so stressed out going to PT school. Uh, I, I love what we do. We have a certain expertise that we have to learn definitely, but I wish there were a little breathing room in there for them to get some experience in the real world other than just their clinical education, which is one, one important aspect of this elective. And then two, creating cultures. I, I, I thought up at the beginning of the year to tell the first year, first year students that Uh, When I had the bully pulpit and I was in front of the class, I said, you know what? I want you to begin creating your professional persona right now. I want you to start, begin creating the culture that you would want to work in and live in and study in. You know, say hi to each other when you go down the hall. Create these cultures because I was really fortunate. My first job out of school was at a great place. It had a great culture. And when you, when you move from that and you perhaps have a, a family member that's in, in the medical care system, uh, I had a, uh, my mother-in-law unfortunately passed away last summer, but when we were in the hospital, I thought to myself, man, these people are getting away with acting like, acting so unprofessionally. It was so upsetting that in New York City, we should have great institutions of healthcare. And that's just not the fact. You know, across the country, uh, I know people are pressured and I know uh, the medical system is pressured and I, I know certain people don't get paid a certain amount, but still we can create that kind of culture where we'd still like to come in and, and work within. And it's good for the patients and it's good for our, ourselves. Create the culture you want. 
No, I love that. I think those are some absolutely fantastic takes because I think, you know, just listening to everyone speak here tonight, I've definitely really learned quite a bit from either of you guys too. And I hope that our audience comprised of students, other healthcare providers, but also educators as well can definitely listen to what's been said and these suggestions. And, you know, guys, before we kind of, before we kind of wrap up here, where can people find you guys online or on social media if they want to connect with you or kind of ask further questions about this program and initiative? Yeah. So you can, you know, my email is jlipsky18 at uh, uh, gmail.com if you ever want to, you know, get in touch and connect more. But my Facebook is Joe Lipsky, uh, J-O-E space L-I-P-S-K-Y. Uh, my Instagram and Twitter are both the same. So it's just Joseph underscore Lipsky one. Happy to talk about the class anytime. This is Dr. Stewart. I'm, uh, I'm at, at Malin Stewart on Twitter at M-A-H-L-O-N-S-T-E-W-A-R-T at Malin Stewart. I think that's the best place to get me. You can find me on Facebook, Sean Whited. My name is S-H-A-U-N, last name W-H-I-T-E-E at Twitter. You can get me at Sean underscore Whited. You can reach out to me via email with Whited.Sean at gmail.com. And you can also find me on Facebook. Please reach out. I'd love to chat and help maybe any questions you have or or just to chat about different ideas. You guys can find me on Facebook, James Sinodinos, S-I-N-O-D-I-N-O-S. Um, my email is J Sinodinos, same spelling, number two at gmail.com. And my Instagram is J underscore S I N O. Any questions? Would love to hear about any ideas anyone has. Any comments on the, the class that we have at Columbia? Thank you. I can't wait to see what uh, big things you guys are going to bring into the profession once you graduate. So appreciate all you're doing out there to really push the needle forward. And Dr. Stewart, thank you as well. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, as we greatly appreciate your support to help us advance healthcare education. We are very happy to announce that we have created a new tool to help develop clinicians into better experts. With that being said, we have created the HET Light Tool, which LIGHT stands for Learning Integrated Towards Expertise. And what we've done is we've taken our first year's worth of episodes with experts in the fields of healthcare and education, and we've taken one golden nugget or theory on expertise and presented it to you in a very easily consumable format so that people can take one lesson or nugget per week and map out and plan how to incorporate it into your clinical and educational practices. And by the end of the year, we think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how far you've progressed towards becoming an expert. To find out more, please check it out at pteducator.com slash H-E-T, which is also available in our show notes. Thank you again all for your continued support. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.